Good morning! Today we are going to review the universal gravitation topics covered on the AP Physics 1 exam. Hey guys. Hey Ball. Uh, hi Ball. Flippin' Physics. Let's start with Newton's universal law of gravitation, which I like to call the Big G equation. The force of gravity that exists between any two objects is equal to big G, which is the universal gravitational constant, times the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by r squared, where big G is a constant and it is given as big G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meter squared divided by kilograms squared. And m is the mass of the two objects in kilograms. It is R that usually gives students trouble. So, class, R is not the, the radius. R is the, the distance, distance between the centers of mass of the two objects. objects. Which can be confusing because sometimes R is the, the radius. Again, R is not defined as the radius, but rather the distance between the centers of mass of the two objects. And this can be confusing because sometimes R does work out to be the radius, but not always. So now that we have two different equations for the force of gravity, let's make sure we understand the difference between the two. The force of gravity equals the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity is a planet-specific equation. We just need to know or be able to figure out the acceleration due to gravity, little g, on the surface of that planet. Newton's universal law of gravitation, unlike the planet-specific equation for the force of gravity, is always applicable. Notice we can set the magnitudes of these two equations for the force of gravity equal to one another to solve for the acceleration due to gravity on any celestial object. More specifically, we can figure out the acceleration due to gravity here on planet Earth. So the force of gravity that exists between an object and the Earth is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity here on planet Earth, which is equal to big G times the mass of the object times the mass of the Earth divided by r squared. Now r, remember, is not the radius, but rather the distance between the center of the Earth and the center of the object, which is going to be equal to the radius of the Earth plus the altitude of that object and we can cancel out the mass of the object from both sides of the equation. And we have an equation for the acceleration due to gravity that exists here on planet Earth. On a local level, that looks like this. The gravitational field is represented using a vector field, which is these arrows. And because our height is very small compared to the radius of the Earth, the gravitational field can be considered to be constant. However, when we look at it from a much larger global perspective, the gravitational field is not constant, which is why these gravitational field lines are not parallel to one another. The closer those field lines are to one another, the larger the gravitational field. Okay, let's take a look at a satellite in orbit around planet Earth. How would you solve for the linear velocity of the satellite? Bo? Okay. Um, the satellite is moving in a circle, so we need to sum the forces in the in direction. However, before we can do that, we need to draw a free body diagram of the forces acting on the satellite. The only force acting on the satellite is the force of gravity, which is caused by the Earth. Now we know the net force in the indirection acting on the satellite equals the force of gravity, which is positive because it's in the indirection. And the net force equals the mass of the satellite times the acceleration in the indirection, which is the centripetal acceleration. We can substitute big G times the mass of the satellite times the mass of the Earth, all divided by R squared, which then equals the mass of the satellite times... Uh, we can substitute tangent to velocity squared divided by r for centripetal acceleration. The mass of the satellite cancels out, and the inverse of r cancels out, and we take the square root of the whole equation to get tangent to velocity equals the square root of big G times the mass of the Earth, all divided by r. Oh, and we should substitute in the radius of the Earth plus the altitude of the satellite in for r to get our answer for the tangential velocity of the satellite.
Bo, very nice. Now let's talk about gravitational potential energy. Our equation for the gravitational potential energy of an object, which is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity times the vertical height above the zero line, requires a constant gravitational field. When you have a non-constant gravitational field, we need a different equation. We need the equation for universal gravitational potential energy. Universal gravitational potential energy equals the negative of big G times the mass of one object times the mass of the second object divided by R. Now, this looks very similar to Newton's universal law of gravitation, and it is that same R value, where R is not the radius, it is the distance between the centers of mass of the two objects. Given the similarities between the equation for universal gravitational potential energy and Newton's universal law of gravitation, it is very common for students to add a square to this equation. Please do not. R is not squared in universal gravitational potential energy. Okay, let's also talk about this negative. Universal gravitational potential energy is always less than or equal to zero. <laughs> yes? But what does it mean that the gravitational potential energy is always less than or equal to zero? <laughs> I know, this is always a source of confusion for students. So let's go back to the equation for a constant gravitational field for gravitational potential energy. When we used this equation, we always had to set the horizontal zero line. When using the equation for universal gravitational potential energy in a non-constant gravitational field, we do not need to set the zero line. It has already been set for us. It is set with the two objects infinitely far apart. But what is anything divided by infinity? Anything divided by infinity is zero. Which means the universal gravitational potential energy between two objects which are infinitely far apart is going to be equal to zero because anything divided by infinity equals zero. That is why universal gravitational potential energy is always less than or equal to zero. In all other cases, R is going to be less than infinitely large, therefore it's like we are below the zero line where the universal gravitational potential energy is negative. Which brings me to another point. A single object cannot have universal gravitational potential energy. Universal gravitational potential energy is defined as the gravitational potential energy that exists between two objects, mass one and mass two. Mr. P? Yes, Billy. What about the regular gravitational potential energy, mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the vertical height above the zero line? That equation only has one mass in it. <laughs> okay, this is the equation for the gravitational potential energy that exists between the object and planet Earth. So there are two objects involved in the equation for gravitational potential energy in a constant gravitational field. We have reached the end of my review of universal gravitation for AP Physics 1. My next review lesson is about simple harmonic motion. You are welcome to enjoy that video. You can also visit my website, flippingphysics.com, where you can find all of my AP Physics 1 review lessons organized with lecture notes. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.